that way. Um, there we go. So folks, uh, this is Professor David Hochfelder at, over at SUNY Albany. He's a history professor over there, but he does a lot with um, Solarize Albany, which is an initiative in our local community to promote solar power. Um, he's got a background in electrical engineering as well. So um, as he's been talking here, you, you know that he's hoping to answer more of your questions instead of some, doing something kind of formal. So. Yeah. Um, maybe we can start, Dave, since today is Earth Day, perhaps maybe we can start there with a little bit yeah. of that history. Yeah, so the first Earth Day was, was 1970, and um, it was basically started um, by college students to sort of dramatize, you know, the, the plight of the planet. And um, until uh, the federal government passed clean air and water regulations and set up the Environmental Protection Agency in the early 70s, um, you know, states could do this on a limited basis. New York and California were some of the early um, early states that, that moved to, to uh, create environmental protections. Um, but the, the state of the environment was, was fairly bad by the late 60s. Um, there's a famous story of the Cuyahoga River in downtown Cleveland that caught fire. And um, it's 1967 or 1968. And the mayor at the time, mayor of Cleveland, held a press conference and he basically said, I don't see why everyone's making a big deal out of this. This happens all the time. You know, so um, Lake Erie in the Midwest uh, was so polluted that that there were no fish living. You couldn't fish at Lake Erie. Um, uh, the Hudson River was very polluted. So, you know, you couldn't fish or swim in the Hudson River. So environmental legislation, um, you know, in order to get sweeping reforms passed, you know, we're talking about a lot of different things now, John Lewis Voting Rights Act and so forth. Um, thinking of the history of both the environmental movement and the civil rights movement in the 60s, in order to have meaningful reform, you need to have two things happen at once, um, or there's two levels to this. You need engaged, active citizens who are going to mobilize and press for change. And then you need elected officials at the state and federal levels who are commit, committed to achieving those same goals. So with the environment, Earth Day was one of the ways that um, activists and organizers mobilized um, popular support for uh, pro-environment policies, environmental uh, regulations. Um, at the same time, elected officials were aware that something needed to be done. So you need both levels, I think, to, to enact meaningful, long-term, permanent change. You need to have grassroots mobilization, um, and you need to have enough legislators and elected leaders, elected officials, who are willing to listen to what the citizens are, are asking for. So um, Earth Day is really part of that kind of citizen mobilization, and it really aroused people to be more aware of the environment, and um, uh, the so-called ecology movement comes out of that. And this is part of the, you know, there's a lot happening in the 60s, right? There's civil rights, there's um, the second wave feminist movement, um, there's gay, lesbian, bisexual, and, and, and trans rights. Um, a lot of social movements. So the environmental movement was one movement like that in this period of, of um, you know, enormous citizen engagement in all sorts of areas to address all sorts of injustices. Um, in the decade before this, you had books like Silent Spring written by biologist Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. And the reason she called it Silent Spring is because she argued well, she didn't argue, she used science to demonstrate more of the point that um, DDT, a pesticide that was widely used to kill mosquitoes, that DDT was getting into the food chain and had a um, very bad effect on bird populations. So the reason that she entitled her book Silent Spring was imagine waking up on a spring morning to silence and not hearing birds. So that really dramatized the need for um, for thinking about the environment. At the same time, you had a, a um, biologist at St. Louis University, or no, Washington University in St. Louis, Barry Commoner, who collected baby teeth. He asked parents and children to send their baby teeth in after they had fallen out. And he analyzed baby teeth for an isotope called strontium-90, which was a byproduct of, of 
uh, atmospheric nuclear testing. And he made the argument that strontium-90 was showing up in children's teeth because it was showing up in the milk that kids were drinking. And that was instrumental in getting the federal government to negotiate a, a test ban treaty with other nuclear powers to stop above ground nuclear testing. Um, this kind of boggles the mind, but in the 50s and 60s, the United States government routinely detonated atomic weapons, hydrogen weapons, in places like Nevada and Utah. Um, you know, these were atmospheric tests. And they tried to make sure the wind wasn't blowing toward a population center, but sometimes you never know. Um, Entire cast of a, a film called The Conqueror, which is possibly the world's worst movie, um, starring John Wayne playing Genghis Khan. That's how bad this movie is. Um, the entire cast and crew uh, was downwind from one of these nuclear tests, and virtually everybody associated with the film uh, developed cancer at some point in their lives, and many died from it. So um, Earth Day really was sort of the culmination of several kinds of citizen activism around environmental issues. Um, in the 1960s, and it's in 1970 really was 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 an attempt to sort of raise awareness for citizens at large, but also elected officials. So that's my brief history of of Earth Day. Any any questions or comments on that? Please, I, I want I don't want to talk. I want this to be a conversation. So, folks, maybe you can start to unmute yourselves. I mean, this isn't a class, but we expect. I mean, you're here to write to ask things and interact. So maybe a question I'll throw out to you guys then. What are you doing for Earth Day? What personal actions are you taking, you, either yourselves or your families, on Earth Day this year? <laughs> OK. Uh, let me come, come at this from, from another, another direction. What sort of um, environmental activities, pro-environmental activities, do you engage in on an everyday basis? I go hike nature trails every day, and I, I try to get people out there, make people aware and appreciate the environment around us. It's not much, but. Okay. Good. And, and remind me, you guys are in, in seventh eighth grade? Is that right? No, these are high school kids, nine through 12. Hello? So these are um, ninth grade through twelfth grade. So they're we're over at the high school. Um, I know our school district today put you out. Can you hear me? See me? Am I frozen? Uh, you froze. Your your video is frozen right this minute, but we can. All right. I you know what? I'm going to kill my video to save bandwidth. Okay. All right. Um, sorry about that. So um, uh, you guys are in seventh and eighth grade, right? No, these are ninth graders through twelfth graders, Dave. We've got oh, high school kids. Yep. Um, so you go hiking and try to introduce people to. Okay. Anyone else? What kind of environmental actions do you take on a daily basis? Oh, come on. You've got to have some. You probably don't even realize. Yes. Recycle? Okay. Interesting history. I'll tell you a personal story about recycling. Um, when I was just out of college, this is around, this is around 1990, um, I was, I was uh, dating a woman my, my age, you know, mid-20s, and um, no one recycled at this point. I, I grew up in Chicago, which is a major city. You would think a major city would have recycling by 1990. She would take her um, uh, Coke cans and, and soup cans and other cans that she, you know, um, used in, in the household. And she had this can crusher on her pantry door, you know, the door to the, the, the pantry where she kept her food. I remember coming over one time to her apartment and, uh, you know, she had a bunch of cans that she was crushing, this big lever thing. And she would, you know, pull it down and crush the cans and then um, collect all the cans. And when she got a box full, you know, maybe 20 pounds worth, she would take the cans to a scrap dealer. So the city didn't have a, a municipal recycling program at this point. And she, she was a member of the Sierra Club and very environmentally conscious. So she was doing her, but she also made a little extra money, not much, but you know, it was impossible back then 
to actually recycle, you know, through the municipal waste collection system. You know, today that's a lot easier, you know, oh. with recycling bins all over the place. So recycling is good. Um, any other pro-environment actions you guys take on a, on a daily basis? Documentary about the impact of the textile industry has on water supply. Good. Thank you, Sydney. I'll tell you, our, our campus had, um, the school district was putting out, and so those of you later today, you can go out and do this. I know it's extremely windy, so it's a great day for trash to be flying all over the place. Yeah. Um, but they were asking students and their families on Earth Day to go out and take photographs of themselves cleaning up their neighborhoods and then submit those to our, our school district so that way they go on uh, our school district's Facebook page. Yes. Jacob? I think you get um, my history teacher said you can also do that tomorrow since it's not very nice out today. Okay. Well, but see, so what other things could you do like today, for example, even with the wind is what Professor Hockfelder is asking you. What kind of things do you do on a daily basis to kind of honor our planet? Pick up trash. Well, at least pick up trash so like you felt like the like chopped on the floor. I mean, I would grab other people's trash, but like you never know if there's like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say pick pick up after yourself, especially like if you're eating outside or something like that. Yeah. Um, Sarah I, mentioned uh, planting trees. I'm sorry, Selma, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I reduced the amount of meat that I eat. So I eat more soy-based products, um, kind of like I, I eat a lot of tofu like meat alternatives that's a good that's an excellent way to reduce your carbon footprint um i've been eating more of you know things like impossible burgers and beyond burgers and honest to god i can't wait for lab grown meat to come down in price where it's commercially available because um cleaning out emails each email you send generates carbon yeah that, that's also good um so there are all sorts of reasons for reducing meat consumption, including CO2 and including the ethical dimensions of, um, of you know, eating animals. Um, so that, that's a good example. Thank you. There was some more in the chat. Somebody was saying like turning off the water while you're brushing your teeth yep. to reduce your water, shorter showers. It's all good. Um, some things you, you and your families could do um, you know, I just saw a news item today that the Biden administration really wants to move into pretty aggressively into electric vehicles. Mm. And um, my wife and I have one, we're a one car household, which a lot of people think is, is, is crazy in Albany, but uh, we both grew up in urban environments and I didn't have a driver's license until I was in my twenties. I simply didn't need one um, living in a, in a city with good mass transit. Um, same thing with my wife. She lived in Washington, DC and took the Metro everywhere. Um, so we have a Chevy Volt, which gets about 50 miles of range on a battery charge. New York's, um, where the state of New York or how the state of New York generates its electricity makes that better than burning gasoline. However, if you lived in a state like Kentucky or West Virginia, where virtually all the electricity is generated from coal, driving an electric vehicle would make absolutely no environmental sense. So, um, you know, in order to get to a, a, a zero carbon economy, we need to electrify transportation. We need to electrify home heating and cooling, and we need to electrify um, virtually everything and then generate that electricity with renewables. Um, so hopefully we'll get there at some point by mid century. I'm kind of optimistic about that. Um, but, you know, I think we all want to live in, a, in a, a carbon neutral or a zero carbon world in order to get to, get to that point. We're going to have to totally change the way we generate and consume energy. Um, infrastructure will last generations. So, you know, the interstate highway system is 70 years old now. Um, oil pipelines and refineries are several generations old at this point. So there's a lot of legacy so-called uh, infrastructure out there that's going to need to be updated or replaced. So it's going to be an interesting task, and I think you guys will, will be central to it. Um, let me let me shift gears a bit and and talk about um, what you're. I, I'm curious, 
to see what your career goals are. Since you're in the STEM club, I assume something in the STEM field, but um, uh, Sarah, yes, rechargeable batteries. Um, I've moved to entirely rechargeable batteries at this point. Um, and um, we also have a share in a, in a community solar array. So, um, you know, that, that doubles, doubles the advantage of rechargeable batteries. So I'm curious, what, what are your career goals? Who, uh, just someone, uh, algebra teachers, Sarah, okay. Good. I, Sarah, do you like algebra then? Yeah, she says math is cool, good. Good, India, uh, art restoration, art history and chemistry. If you have a chance, um, Peebles Island, which is between Waterford and um, Cohoes, I think. Yep. Um, this is where the state historic preservation labs are. And they used to do open houses every spring and I hope they resume doing them at some point. Uh, Chris says you, you hike there frequently. Okay, good, so you know the building and, and all that. But the, the interesting thing about the open house, and I take my, my public history classes there all the time, they have conservators doing um, all sorts of conservation, um, cloth, textile, sorry, textiles, paper, uh, furniture. Um, and if you really want to get a, a kind of real world sense of what an art conservator does, um, you know, try and schedule, you know, post COVID, try and schedule, you know, a, a, um, a look around. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else? So guys, what are you thinking about doing after high school or college? That's what we're kind of wondering. Anyone want to go to engineering? Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, integrating a law degree and an engineering degree. Oh. So you want to do patent law? Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Okay, good. Um, one of my regrets now, when I was in college, I took the bare minimum number of computer courses. I was an electrical engineering major. We had to take two computer courses, programming courses, and I hated it. I ran screaming as far as I could from computers. And I regret that now because um, so much of the world runs on, on computers and I was, you know, I, I chose a different path entirely. I worked in, in nuclear power plants, but um, I, my, my ignorance of how computers work is, is shocking. And if I could go back in time and talk to my 17 year old self, I'd be like, you know, take more computer classes. But you trust me, you'll thank me 30 years from now, you know. Um, so that's probably my biggest regret in my engineering education. I see Selma said she's thinking about medicine. Okay, good. Thanks, Selma. How about the rest of you? Chime in. What are you going to plan to major in in college, if you're going to college? No idea? Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Jacob, what grade are you in? I'm in ninth. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you, you have a few more Yeah. Well, I would assume, Jacob, if you're here and you enjoy STEM subjects, that STEM might be an option for you if you enjoy it. Yes. yes. Anyone else? So do you have any questions about like the college application process maybe? Anything I could sort of provide some insight on? Okay. <laughs> They're killing us, Dave. No one wants know, to right? say anything. Come on, folks, you gotta speak up, speak up. <clears throat> General tips, uh, thanks, India. Um, yeah, I, I think, the SUNY system here, New York has a really good public university system. It's, it's affordable, you know, you can get a top flight education pretty much anywhere, but the SUNY system is really good. And um, 
for liberal arts, SUNY Geneseo is probably the best. Um, if you want to do engineering, um, the, the Nano College here in, in Albany and Utica is pretty good. Um, uh, Binghamton has a good engineering school. I don't know about Buffalo, um, but the state system here is really affordable and really good. So um, especially the new Excelsior program, I think if your family's income is below a certain threshold, you're, you, you'd be tuition free. And I don't know the specifics of that. So I would encourage you to look at, at um, SUNY schools um, because you can get a great education and, and they're very affordable. Um, the one downside to a state school is sometimes the class sizes can be pretty big. So if you want, you know, only 10 people in a class, you're going to be going to a very expensive private college like Williams or someplace like that. So that's the one drawback to, to, to a, a SUNY, to a public university system like SUNY. Um, some of your class sizes will tend to be large. But um, you can still get, a, you know, again, an excellent education, very affordable. Excelsior family has to make less than 125000 a year. Thank you. Um, my family would certainly qualify. So um, that's, I think that's the one major kind of piece of guidance I would give is, is um, your guidance counselor or your parents might be, you know, talking about sending you to a, you know, an Ivy League school or what have you. Um, but you can get it as good an education for much less money at a, at a, at a, at, you know, through the SUNY system. Especially for, un, I'd have to say for undergraduate, that's a great place to start. And then if they wanted to pursue graduate degrees, of course, mm -hmm. things are, are very different at the graduate level where, you know, hopefully they're kind of recruited into those programs and wouldn't have to necessarily pay yeah. depending, yeah. depending on grants and, and things of that nature, so. Make them pay you to go to graduate school. Don't right. pay them to go to graduate school. Um, okay, anything else on, on your minds? That... All right, so maybe then I will resort to some. Dave, I'm gonna ask you if you can. Can you talk a little bit about, um, we were talking about Earth Day and then um, it kind of segued into electric power generation. And you were saying like some, some states are very coal oriented and New York seems to be going more towards renewables. Can you talk a little bit about the history of how our infrastructure kind of came out, came to be the way it is? Yeah, um, I'm gonna throw this out as a question. When do you think the first electrical grid was set up here in the US, here in New York State actually? Very first electrical grid. And feel free to Google it, you know, I don't care. 1930, okay, Chris, that's a good guess. 1882, wait, Luke, Luke says 1882. Why 1882? That's very specific. Thomas Edison, okay. Are you a Thomas Edison fan then, Luke? Not really. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, you know, we learn in, in history class that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Thomas Edison, yeah, he invented the, okay, sure, he had a particular design for an incandescent lamp. Um, what Edison really did is he developed an entire system of generating, transmitting, distributing, and using electricity. And he did this in the business district in Manhattan, Wall Street, because that's where his investors were. He wanted to impress his investors. And he set up his system um, to compete with um, indoor gas lighting. Mm -hmm. And you know, back in the 19th century, cities had these networks of, of you know gas lines, and inside people's houses there were these these gas pipes. And if you live in an old house, you still may have these gas pipes somewhere. And um, you would you know take a match, turn on the the, um, the valve, take a match, light the lamp, put it inside like a hurricane lamp enclosure, um, and that was the standard way to to light a house in a, in a city. You know, out in the countryside, people didn't have those networks and used, you know, kerosene or, or burn wood. Um, so Edison looked at the business model for these, you know, gas companies providing indoor lighting. And he deliberately set up his system to compete with these gas companies, these incumbent, this incumbent technology. 
And he built his first grid in downtown Manhattan in New York's financial district, again, to impress the investors. Gave away the light bulbs for free at first. Um, and then became a commercial success. And he wound up building similar systems, about a square mile in, in area, um, similar systems throughout, throughout the country. And then um, in the 1880s and 1890s, around 18, 1890, Nikola Tesla, I mean, Tesla famous. Mm -hmm. Luke, oh. what do you think about Tesla? <laughs> Where's my physics students? We were just talking about Nikolai Where? Tesla. <laughs> we did. We were talking about mag electromagnetism. Okay, good. We were talking about him. Um, I think my favorite person researching in, in the field of electromagnetism in the 18th or 18th century, 19th century rather. Uh, there are two people. Uh, Michael Faraday. I think he was yeah. a brilliant experimental physicist, and. Um, Hometown boy Joseph Henry. Oh did yeah. You talk about Joseph Henry. We did not talk about Joseph Henry. Okay. The every the kids know Tesla a little bit because of now they're hearing about the cars. <laughs> so right. they wanted, right. you know, but. Um, Joseph Henry was um, born in Galway in Sarah, what is now Saratoga County. Um, taught high school at the Albany Academy, which is still in existence. Yeah. The old Al Albany Academy building is downtown, right across from City Hall in the state capital. Um, Joseph Henry basically invented the electromagnet. So if you're talking about electromagnetism, Joseph Henry basically did it here in Albany and he demonstrated it to his classes, ran a couple miles of wire around his classroom and um, showed that he could work a magnet through two miles of wire and then had enormous magnets that could hold up um, several hundred pounds of iron weight. And other people looked at that and said, oh, well, why can't we generate electricity then? So they took Henry's basic insights and then um, went on to, to develop electricity generation technologies. Um, there are two physicists before the Civil War working in the United States who had international reputations. Joseph Henry was one. Can you think of another scientist working in the United States? I'll give you a hint, this is 18th century. Another scientist working in the United States who had an international reputation. Think of a kite. Give him a hint. Yeah, he flew a kite in a thunderstorm. <laughs> yep, Ben Franklin. Uh, 1740s, early on, he proved that the lightning was electricity and went on to do a bunch of other stuff. Um, but um, yeah, he was, he was an enormously international, you know, enormous international respect for Franklin's science. Joseph Henry was kind of his successor. Henry would go on to better things than the Albany Academy, you know, teaching high school. He went to, uh, to Princeton and taught there for a while, and then he became the first head of the Smithsonian. Oh. So Joseph Henry, local boy, um, born and raised on a farm in, in Galway, New York, and, um, you know, made the big time. So um, later in the 19th century, you know, the problem with Edison's system was it could, because it, was, it operated on direct current, it couldn't really... Um, transmit power very far, about a mile, like I said. So Westinghouse and Tesla come along, and Tesla had one brilliant idea, and that was the um, multi-phase electric motor. Everything else Tesla thought of, in my opinion, in any way, he was kind of a crackpot. Um, nothing practical, except that one thing. So Tesla really developed alternating current electricity, which could be transmitted over large distances. And the first real kind of spectacular use of that was the first hydroelectric power station at Niagara Falls. I'm sorry, I, I, I missed that. Somebody just came into the meet, that's. Oh, okay. Um, so sometime in the 1890s, Tesla is um, instrumental in setting up um, this hydroelectric power station at Niagara Falls that powers the city of Buffalo. So, a um, little bit of the history there. Um, let me, uh, share my screen. How do I share screen? So on the bottom right, there's a present now option. Got it. Um, this is one of my favorite. Can you guys see that? Um, did you, so you have to tell it what you want to present, a window, a tab, or the entire screen. And then you say, okay, there we go. Now it's coming up. Okay. This is a lot easier than Zoom. So this is something, I'm sorry? 
It's meant to be. <laughs> yeah. So this is something that uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is in California, produces every year. And um, Michelle, I think you were asking about you know the energy mix. Yeah. You know, where the energy comes from. Um, there's a couple of really, I, I love this, this visualization. On the left-hand side are all the sources of energy that are, that are burned. They, well, nuclear and solar and hydro and wind are not burned, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. On the left-hand side are kind of the fuels that we use to generate electricity or um, you know, uh, drive our cars or heat our, heat our homes and businesses. So um, the United States consumed 92.9 quadrillion British thermal units. God help me, do not ask me what a British thermal unit is. We should have gone metric decades ago. Um, and this is down from 2019 because of the pandemic, actually. Yeah. Um, the 2019 one, I believe, was closer to 100. So but I want to point out a couple striking things about this. So the 93 quads that are burned here on this left side, two thirds are in the form of rejected energy. What do you think that means? I can't see the screen, so please verbalize. What does that rejected energy mean? I know the answer, so I'm not gonna say it. I want them to pipe in. All right, or alternatively, let's go down here to energy services. What do you think that term means? Any ideas? It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Nope, it does not. Just speculate recklessly. There's no, no, um, you know, just feel free to, to say what you think. Okay, so there's some things coming up in the chat. Which I can't see. Okay, so it says, uh, somebody said, energy that's not produced as electricity. Another idea is rejected energy is energy that's rejected and has not been used. Uh, okay. Gas in cars, like gas in cars maybe. Okay. Rejected energy means stuff that's, energy that's lost either because of the laws of thermodynamics um, Michelle, I assume you haven't covered the laws of thermodynamics. No, it's not in physics anymore. We don't do that in physics. That's chemistry now they do that. So. Chemistry, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't, the laws of thermodynamics basically are you can't win, you can't break even, and you can't quit the game. Um, those are the three laws of thermodynamics. Basically, anytime you burn energy, you're going to lose energy. There's no way around it. That's, that's just thermodynamics. The other form of, of rejected energy is electrical resistance in the power grid. So let's just take electricity generation. For, so one third only of the energy we produce on the left hand side, only one third is put to useful purposes. Two thirds is, is, is waste, heat, or, or res, electrical, electrical resistance. So this is an enormous opportunity for efficiency gains. And this is, I'm going to give you my pitch for solar in a second. So let's go to electricity generation. 35.6 quads consumed for electricity. Of that, only 12.4 comes out as energy that actually does anything useful. So two thirds of electricity, the, the um, um, energy used to produce electricity, two thirds of that is lost as well. And only one third is used. Now, these categories here, the renewables, solar and wind, um, 10 years ago, these were, were too small to even make it to the chart, to the flow chart. So this is a, a, a useful sign or, or a hopeful sign. Solar and wind is um, kind of catching up to coal, which is good. Petroleum, very little petroleum is used to generate electricity. Uh, most of it goes to transportation, and some of it goes to industrial to make plastics. 
So solar and wind are now becoming major, more bigger players in, in um, electricity generation. That said, this rejected energy, if you're getting your electricity from, say, Indian Point, which is, you know, um, 90 miles south of here, you know, nuclear plant 90 miles south of here, that electricity has to travel 90 miles. Michelle, have you, have you done Ohm's Law yet? Oh, yes. In physics, we have, yep. Okay. So, you know that V equals IR, um, voltage equals current times resistance. And there's always resistance, even in, in um, you know, unless you're using a you know, super cold superconductor, but that's not practical commercially. Every copper wire has resistance. You can't get around that, just like thermodynamics. So if you're getting your electricity from 90 miles away, maybe you're only getting a third of the electricity that comes out of the plant, you know, into your wall outlets. Mm -hmm. The benefit of solar is if you have solar panels on your roof, you're consuming that electricity right on site. There's no loss. There's no resistive loss. You're not using, losing electricity to electrical resistance. Everything you produce, virtually everything you produce, is being used on site without loss. So that's the benefit of local generation of electricity through solar. Any questions on this? Okay, I'll pop the link into the chat. Oh, I have to stop sharing the screen. So I'll pop the link into the chat so you guys can look at it a little bit further. And I've got the beach ball now. Bear with me a second. Okay. There we go. Um, all right, this is, how do I get to the chat? Oh, here's the chat. Again, this is so much easier than Zoom. It, yeah, and it, the, there are some drawbacks to it as an educator. You, I mean, <laughs> I can't schedule things the way I, I would be able to do in Zoom, but that's okay. We're yeah. So, um, you know, that's the virtue of, of solar, especially rooftop solar. Mm -hmm. uh, not just that it's carbon free, you know, there's some carbon that gets uh, consumed, you know, building the panels and, and installing this, the solar array. But by and large, once that's done, it's carbon-free electricity. That's, you know, a major benefit. But another benefit is you're not wasting any of that electricity through transmitting over a long distance. Any questions or comments on that? Maybe you can talk a little bit about community solar and how that works. Yeah. Um, so in addition, and community solar is often produced, not on your rooftop, but, but very, very close to, to, to where people live. And um, that same efficiency because of distance, you know, you'll get that from community solar. So community solar um, is actually what, what we have. Um, we own the panels, which is an older business model. The business model now is a bit different. So a community solar company will um, get some land somewhere, you know, say 20 acres of land, and they'll put solar panels on that land and then sell the electricity to customers. So it's almost like buying your electricity from National Grid, except you're buying from a smaller producer. And a 20-acre site can maybe power 1,000 homes. Um, and what you would do is you would sign up for, with a company like Common Energy is, is, is the one we work with at Solarize. And you buy the electricity directly from a company like Common Energy that generates using solar. And they will offer you um, an electricity rate that is 10% below what National Grid charges. So you're not saving a, you know, a stupendous amount of money, but you're saving you know, 10, 15 bucks a month. Um, the benefit, main benefit is that you're using carbon -free, a carbon-free energy source as opposed to National Grid, which, um, is pretty good compared to other other states, or New York is pretty good compared to other states. But it's even better if you're if you're getting the electricity through um, through entirely renewable sources of, of generation. Um, if you're interested in community solar, uh, you know, talk to your, your families about this. And um, uh, Michelle has my contact uh, has my contact information 
and um, you know, feel free to, to contact uh, Ms. Famoso and she can connect you and your family with, with Solarize Albany and the company we work with called Common Energy. Okay. I, have to, I have to email you about that because I'm now in a, in a place where um, I can't put solar panels on my house. So it's like, all right, then I need to go community solar. The other great thing about community solar, and I'll, again, I'll pop the link to Solarize Albany into the chat. The great thing about community solar is, you know, a lot of people, when we started doing Solarize back in 2014, we were all focused just entirely on rooftop. A lot of people look at rooftop and they're like, well, this costs, you know, thousands of dollars. I can't afford this. Well, you can because you can finance the, you know, the, the, the purchase like a car or like a new kitchen. Um, but a lot of people, you know, living in, in, say, downtown Albany don't have a good roof. Or like in your case, you don't have a suitable place on your own property. Um, or if you're a renter, you know, if, if you're renting an apartment, you can't put solar on you know, solar panels on the roof of your apartment building. So community solar really opens up the market to, to households that otherwise would not be able to adopt solar. So any questions, anything you, you guys want to talk about? Um, ask me, offer, uh, shift in topic, anything at all. I don't know if it's if we're getting zoomed out, um, like they're calling this zoom fatigue, or if they're. I'm not sure what what's going on. Usually, they're a little more talkative. Um, can any of you pipe in? I mean, you know, look, I'm here. You might as well ask me things. <laughs> Sarah asked, how did St. Patrick's Day start? <laughs> um, I have no idea. I want to ask you something a little off topic, Gabe. Okay. Um, if I may. Oh, there, here's a question from one of them. Is the solar energy, is solar energy less stable? No, no. Um, it's, in India, yes, community solar is a really good idea. And it's just about the last few years. Uh, Charisse, um, you can think about the electricity, you know, the electrical grid we all get our electricity from is kind of a big swimming pool. And there's water pouring in at the top, which is the electricity that's generated in power plants. And there's a bunch of little holes at the bottom, and those are the homes and businesses that use electricity. So um, solar would just be another source that gets poured into the pool at the top. Maybe it's a bad analogy, but but um, think of the again the, the electrical grid is, is is a pool, and there's sources coming into the pool, and there's sinks or consumers that that draw electricity out of the pool. One thing, once we're able to resume in-person activities, you can arrange a tour with the New York Independent System Operator and watch how electricity gets sent around the state, and. It's a futuristic control room. It looks like, I don't even know how to describe it. It, um, it looks like where uh, SpaceX launches their rockets from. I mean, it's, and, um, you know, school groups can, they think it's in Rensselaer or East Greenbush. And, um, you know, you can schedule a field trip, you know, for a class or the STEM club pretty easily once things get back to normal. You're not allowed onto the floor. You're um, um, confined to a, an upstairs ob observation gallery behind a, um, a, a glass window because because it's a it's, it's considered a secure facility. It's the organization that that um, sends determines how to send electricity to various places around the state, and um, you know they don't want um, you know bad actors getting inside there and, and disrupting that. I know when um, I've gone on a tour there and they needed um, copies of my driver's license and, you know, social security number. They, they basically run you through a, the U.S. security system to make sure you're not a, a terrorist and all those kinds of things. So 
Um, I know once we can get field trips up and going, that would be a great, a great place to go visit. Very witty used to be instrumental in getting us in over there. <laughs> Do you remember Barry Whitty, one of our technology teachers? Um, yeah, wasn't it um, ex Navy? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think he might have arranged the tour that I, the, the visit that I went on. It may he have been. Yeah, he he did a lot of stuff with um, with Solarize Albany years ago. Yes. I rem I think my first the first time I met you was um, through Barry at a meeting at SUNY Albany. So. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. Um, you know, uh, uh, Sharice, you asked about solar energy being less stable. You may remember a couple months ago that the state of Texas lost electricity for several days. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Do you know why the state of Texas lost electricity outside of the fact that it's a poorly regulated state? They probably um, don't know. They didn't winterize their uh, generation, you know, their, their, their power plants, especially their wind turbines. So when the, the weather dropped below a certain temperature, everything just stopped operating. And then the grid itself, without getting too technical, this is why you have an organization that, that sends power around the state. The state of New York can buy power from um, Pennsylvania, from Ohio, from Massachusetts, from Quebec. We buy a lot of power hydropower from Quebec. Um, in fact, Quebec has, the province of Quebec is virtually 100% hydroelectricity and they have surplus electricity that they routinely sell to New York and New England. State of Texas, their grid is not connected to any other part of the country. So when their grid went down, they couldn't even buy power from neighboring states. So um, the state of Texas basically waived the requirement that every other state has to weatherize your, your generating facilities and your, your, your transmission grid. And then because they don't want the federal government regulating their, their electricity, they don't connect to any other state. So when this um, weather event happened, when this, this freeze happened, they, were, they had no options. Here in New York, if we lost a major generating station, we could probably buy enough power from Canada or from Pennsylvania or Ohio to keep the grid working, even though some areas may experience blackouts. With Texas, virtually the entire state was without electricity for several days. So that was something. I have friends in Texas who who went through that, and they were it was bad for them. Yeah, yeah. people froze to death in their own homes. I mean, it's it's no way to run a railroad. To coin a phrase, um, you know, regulations exist for good reasons, usually, especially with something so important to, to health and safety, like like the electrical grid. Um, any other questions, comments, things I can um, help you with, Sydney? Why doesn't the U.S. run on more renewable energy? Can the country depend on renewable energy? Um, there's a lot of debate about that, and I will um, post another link. Give me a second. So an engineer at Stanford has developed a, a program called the Solutions Project, and he basically says that um, using a mix of solar, onshore and offshore wind, the entire country can go 100% renewable. It's also a professor in the Earth Sciences, Earth Atmospheric Science Department here at U Albany, Richard Perez, who's done really good work on this. And he basically says, until we get cheap enough battery storage, we could resolve some of these capacity issues by building, by overbuilding solar arrays. You know, by building twice as many panels as we would ordinarily need, and they would take care of. Um, you know, sometimes it's sunnier in one place than another, and you'd be able to send the sunny electricity to the places where it's not sunny. So there are ways to there are ways to do it, and I think um, as engineers get smarter about about this, um, this will happen. And I think it'll happen based on two things: um, advances in battery technology, where electricity can be stored more cheaply. Mm -hmm. um, 
and improvements to the electrical grid that will allow for what is called distributed generation. That is, if everyone has solar panels on their houses, you know, the grid is designed to operate with four or five big power plants around the state that generate massive amounts of electricity and then send it out to people's homes and businesses. If we could, um, the electrical grid is not designed to handle solar arrays on everyone's house or a wind farm in every county. So battery storage improvements and um, modernizing the, the grid to take into account renewable energy. And then I think we'll get there. That's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions or comments or issues? On anything at all. Um, by the way, I don't know how Thanksgiving and Christmas started, Sarah. Sorry. I, I'll ask you sometime. This is definitely off topic. You have a lot of um, insight into the South Mall project. I was reading um, about some of your ongoing collaborative efforts there. Under, <laughs> very interesting. I have to. My mom grew up where the South Mall is. So when she was displaced. Where did she, where did she, I'll, I'll post the link to the blog. Where did she grow up? Uh, I don't know the name of the street, but I know she always says the South, they had to, they had to vacate <laughs> because the South Mall was going up. There was an area in downtown Albany that was very, um, you know, it was all ethnic neighborhoods or they were Italian. My grandparents were immigrants. So um, in one of those little areas. And then they moved uptown. So my mom ended up uh, going to Albany High School. She lived on North Allen eventually, but they started off downtown. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk, talk to you more about your family's experiences. Yeah. Thank and you if any that. of you are interested in understanding a little bit about the history of the city of Albany and the Empire State Plaza, the South Mall is the Empire State Plaza. He posted that link there, the 98 acres in Albany. has done a lot of research on that, which is very interesting. It hasn't always been there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it hasn't. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, Cherise, do, do the pandemic have more benefits or harms on the environment? Um, <clears throat> Well, the Lawrence Livermore flowchart that I showed you, energy use has certainly dropped between 2019 and 2020. However, I'm not going to say, oh, that's a good thing, because what that really means is that people weren't driving or going out to do stuff as much. And, you know, there's nothing good about a pandemic that's going to, that, that, that's killed, you know, almost 600,000 American citizens at this point. So um, I don't think the pandemic has much of a silver lining, quite honestly. Yeah. Get your shot when you can, trust me. So those of you that are over 16 or 16 and up, you know our school's doing, um, We last weekend we had a, a COVID vaccine clinic at our high school. And Good. this coming weekend we have one at Shaker High School for North and South Colony students. So Good. if any of you are eligible 16 and over and you haven't received it, please do. And yeah. uh, you can sign up. It's on our school district's webpage. If you need the link to sign up and you don't have it, email me and I will happily send it to you so that way you can go and get your shot on Saturday. Yeah, my, my wife just got her second one this afternoon um, at Pharmacy College. I got my second one last Thursday. So, um, you know, it's I'm looking forward to going out and especially teaching in person again. That's really what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were teaching in person even when we weren't vaccinated. So, um, but it's still not the same it, in the high school having uh, reduced capacity students in the classroom. It's yeah. just not. It's not the same. We we need you all to come back, and yeah. our, that's that is key. That is going to be key to getting everybody back in the schools and getting things up and running as normal as we can. Yeah. You know so. Um, any final thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, issues, anything, anything at all on your minds? Okay, well, 
Um, Michelle has my contact information. If anything occurs to you regarding, um, you know, getting solar for your 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 house, um, either rooftop or community solar, um, anything involving, you know, the history of electricity, um, anything involving the Empire State Plaza, the South Mall, um, anything at all that that I can be of service, please let me know. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate that you, you gave us some time this afternoon. I sure, know my <laughs> Your semester's winding down in another month, right? So. Last day of class is May 10th. I will be double tapped plus two weeks um, next Thursday, but I only have three class meetings after that. I was considering um, asking my students to resume in person but um, last week I got an email from one of my students saying that she had tested positive and she'd taken a picture of the positive test results. So I'm like, you know, probably let's just ride this out and reset and, you know, come back at this in the fall. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I hope you have a great rest of the semester. Thank you folks for uh, coming too. next Thursday. We have another guest speaker. Sharice, what time is um, Mr. Vero joining us next week? Do you know? Six o'clock? I'll double check my calendar. Too. So, folks, I'll post um, a link, Selma. Maybe you can create that uh, slide for us for next week, um, for our meeting next week. I, where's my calendar? Here is. Actually, yeah, I have him down for six o'clock as well. So, um, any questions at all? All right, folks, then I'll see you next week at 6 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, I appreciate it. Nice meeting you all. Nice meeting you, Michelle. Take uh, care. Thank you. Take care.